and my name is Hope Mellinger. So I've been working with a few people for two years now on putting together a mushroom cooperative. Uh, before we get started with our main speaker, William, I'd like to introduce a few other people who have been working with me, and they're going to tell you a little bit about what we're all about. So I would like to start us off with Travis Fluck. He's going to tell a little story and um, start us off this evening. So here you go, Trav. Hi, everyone. I missed you. We missed you. Uh, I'm not sure. I said, I missed you. And then I said, we missed you. I'm not sure if everyone was at our last meeting, but I, an art gallery was kind enough to give us some space, and there were about 100 people that showed up, and that was only our third meeting. So to me, that says that we're on to something here. And I'm just so grateful that everyone's here to show up and, and participate in this moment with me. Once we passed the decriminalization uh, initiative in Denver, a small group of us said to ourselves, a group of us said to ourselves, what do we do now? How does the community responsibly rise to the occasion to handle this new legislation? So after months of exploratory conversations, we decided that a cooperative was the best scaffolding to bring community together and to share resources mutually. Because at the end of the day, everybody that's part of the co-op is a part owner of, of the business. And equity is something that we are desperately working on centering here with the cooperative. Today I'm gonna to tell you a story. It's a, a European story, a, a, a folk story uh, about community. Once upon a time, in the mountains, there was a small village, very vibrant, and they had everything that they needed to be content. One day, two weary travelers came into the village. They had tattered hats, they had torn shirts, their shoes had holes in them. And when they saw this village in such a pleasant, abundant light, they said to themselves, there must be some food here. We're so hungry. They must be willing to share. So they came across the first door and they knocked and a little old woman came to the door and said, hello, what do you want? And they said to the old woman, we're travelers and we're so hungry. Do you care? Do you have anything to share? Do you have any food? And the woman took one look at them and said, no and shut the door. So the travelers went on to the next door that they encountered and they knocked and a small child came to the door and said, hello, what do you want? And the travelers said, we're tired and we're hungry. Do you think you could share? Do you care? Do you have any food? And the child said, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you and shut the door in their face. So one by one, they went to every door in the village knocking getting the same response. No one cared. No one wanted to share. There was no food. So they went to the center of the village and there was a well. And they sat in the well, very discouraged. And they said to themselves, well, if nobody has anything to share and nobody has any food in this village, then they must be worse off than us. And in that revelation, they said to themselves, we're gonna make a magnificent magical soup. So the one traveler got up on the well and shouted, we are master cooks, and if someone could just please get us a cauldron, then we could make the most wonderful soup ever. And a round man emerged from his door after hearing this, and he said, I love to eat. I'll give you a cauldron. So they set the cauldron up in the center of town, and they built a small fire underneath it, and they filled it with cold water. And eventually the fire tickled the cauldron and warmed the water. And the, the village started seeing that something was happening. They could see the steam billowing up into the air. And upon evaluating this, 
They said, well, what's happening here? And the, the soup maker said, we are going to make the most magnificent soup ever. It's going to be delicious. It's going to be nutritious. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be edible. And they reached down, one of the travelers, and grabbed a stone from the ground and took this stone and plopped it in the water and said, we're going to make stone soup. If only we had a carrot. And the other traveler said, well, we knocked on every door and no one had any food and no one had nothing to share. So it, it looks like we're not going to be able to make this soup after all. Discouraged, they, they sh shrugged their shoulders and they turned away from the village and they said, oh, I, you know, this isn't going to happen. A small child came to them and said, I have something. I have a small carrot. And the, and the travelers said, wow, that's amazing. Bring what you've got. Put it in the pot. So as they were chopping up the carrot, smelling the, the steam, they said, well, this soup would be so much better if we just had a potato. And a voice from the back of the crowd, a very low voice, said, well, well I have a potato. And the gentleman offered a potato to the soup. The travelers again smelled the pot cooking and said, you know, this is amazing, but it'd be so much better if we had a few more ingredients. And one by one, the villagers chimed up, well, I have a green bean and I have a kernel of corn. And someone not to be outdone said, well, I have an egg noodle. And one by one, the villagers brought forth little things that they could muster to add to the soup. Eventually, the pot was full of vegetables, and the smell was delicious, and it was so enticing that the villagers went and got tables and tablecloths and soup bowls and cheese plates and fruit and bread. And they were so enticed by the smell that they started tasting it, and they said, oh my gosh, this stone soup, this is incredible. And the traveler said, it is incredible. And the magic ingredient here is sharing. So what I'm trying to say here today is that you might not think that you have enough to save the world or help the, the current state of affairs. But if we all cooperate, if we all put a little bit of something in, then there will be more than enough for us to share, more than enough for us to take care of the weary travelers that come and find us. So in that story, I believe that we, we are the villagers. And there are many weary travelers just waiting to come and visit and hang out. And I don't know where you see yourself in the story, but I don't, I don't appear in the story. I'm a person that knows how grateful I am and knows how abundant I am. And I offer myself. I offer my experience and my wisdom as an ingredient of our soup. And originally we were going to have this meeting at a warehouse space. And in that warehouse space are two flow hoods that are eight foot long that if you were to buy them new cost $40,000 each with overhead cameras and particle detectors. And I'm also donating that to the co-op. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. All right, um, next up, I'd like to welcome Riley Caps. He is a journalist who has been featured in publications such as The Washington Post, Double Blind Magazine, Maps, Shakuna.net, and Local to Denver or Colorado, Rooster Magazine. Here's Riley. Thank you, Hope. So yeah, as Trav said, that story was about hunger. But obviously, there are many types of hunger. There's hunger for meaning. There's hunger for community. There's hunger for purpose. There's hunger for mental health, for physical health, for all kinds of different things. And so, as Hope said, I'm a reporter, but I decided to get involved in this because it seemed like one of the best ways to satiate some hunger that I know that I have, and I believe that a lot of people have too, 
for a place to go. A lot of us grow mushrooms by ourselves, but a place to go to meet other people that grow mushrooms, that love mushrooms, that use mushrooms. And so, as Trav said, we're trying to, we have this warehouse space, and we want to get a better warehouse space where we can have meetings, where we can have the community congregate to share what they know, to have classes, to have a lab with these flow hoods, to sell mushroom growing equipment, to rent mushroom growing equipment, and to make substrates, which are the soil or the uh, from which mushrooms grow, and to to um, so that's the idea. A warehouse space that is the a center for the community, that is like a store but is bigger than a store, that gives us a spot to come and um, to to grow and to learn and to be together. Um, so there's many of us who make it our mission to help people discover how mushrooms can be helpful. And we want this to be the substrate from which mushrooms grow. We want this cooperative to be the substrate from which a stable community grows that is grounding, nourishing, and helpful to our members' lives. Now, we could start a business that looks like a normal business, just has one owner and people works for people work for it but we're trying to start a cooperative we are starting a cooperative and as Trav mentioned we've had so many people donate so many things we've had people donate legal help and um, expertise on growing mushrooms and places to meet and so we've come up with this idea of the cooperative and to explain what a cooperative is and why it is so fundamental to what we're going for and um, how a cooperative mimics mycelium and brings out the best of what the mushrooms have to offer. Um, I want to bring up Caroline Savory. She's the head of Spore. And uh, it's the, do you want to come on up and introduce yourself? That'd be wonderful. She's been developing cooperatives for um, a long time and she's helped us get our legs under us in terms of what this cooperative will look like, how membership will look, what the rates will be to join, all that kind of thing. And um, I'd like to turn it over to Caroline to talk about cooperatives. Hi, everybody. <laughs> what a great crowd. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Savory. Um, and for the past nine years, I've worked as an independent cooperative business development practitioner which is a fancy way of saying I help people start co-ops. Um, and just recently, um, in January of this year, I became the executive director of the, an organization called SPORE, Society for Psychedelic Outreach, Reform, and Education, taking over for Kevin Matthews back there. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> um, and oh, thank you for helping weigh down my notes. I really, I had some things to say tonight, so I really wanted to take, take good notes. All right. I've been asked by my dear friends at Denver Mushroom Co-op to speak for a few minutes about cooperatives. So we probably have a mix of knowledge in this group tonight of co-ops, and I've given more spiels on Co-ops 101 than I can count in my career. So I'm not gonna do that tonight, um, but I am gonna just set some basic ground rules. Like, what is a co-op? What are we dealing with when we are talking about a co-op? All right, number one, a co-op is a type of business that is democratically owned and governed by its members. Number two, uh, the members of a co-op are a community of people with a shared need or aspiration who come together to form a co-op. And number three, a co-op is a business whose products and services are created to benefit the members. It's a very elegant model, right? That's basically all you need to know. That's a co-op. Um, and the official definition of a co-op states that a community can meet its needs or aspirations through the cooperative model. It's aspirations. I want us to linger on that phrase for a moment, whether economic, social, or cultural. So I'm going to say tonight some things that people don't often say about co-ops. Um, I want to say that co-ops are one of the best community organizing vehicles that we have on the planet. 
I want to say that co-ops are about creating greater harmony in a community. Co-ops are about weaving a story of what's possible when we join forces and pool our resources to better the whole community. Co-ops are about building wealth in community, assets, money, talent, skills, knowledge that keeps circulating in place and stays with a community for the long haul. So this story of a cooperative, of forming cooperatives, has been told in many communities across generations, across the planet. Co-ops are nothing new. They've been around for millennia. And they're also cooperation. The story of cooperation is also told across species. So I am no mycologist, but I'm a fan of myco mycology and myco things. I have some mycologist friends who I heard about this from. In many cases, mushrooms have this mechanism where they communicate mycelium that's underground and communicating with plant roots will do so where it sends a signal to the plant root, letting it know that it wants to exchange resources or nutrients, right? And the plant root has to send back a signal that's like a yes signal before that symbiotic relationship can be formed. And that's a lot like a co-op. Co-ops exist at the consent and the participation of their communities. And co-ops succeed because of that. Now, what could possibly <laughs> allow for the conditions where a, a really diverse, really large community is able to come together and align itself in the same direction, have consent for the same thing? I think the answer is story. So I'm really pleased that Travis opened up with a story tonight, because we we're going to tell a story that is bigger than any of us, and we're going to achieve this, this co-op, this, this Denver Mushroom Co-op, through that method. And so the story here is really actually simple and elegant, just like a co-op. The story is about mushroom lovers, right? It's about people who love mushrooms, who want to be closer to mushrooms, who want to have a deeper relationship with mushrooms and with each other, all kinds of mushrooms. We're not just talking about the psychedelic ones here, right? All kinds of mushrooms, people coming together around their shared love to create the conditions for community gatherings, for classes, for um, the sharing of resources and assets, like the, you know, the expensive equipment that was mentioned, that none of us could afford independently. We have to come together for that. So I personally believe that the way we show mushrooms our love is by modeling them. Because when we do that, we let them know in a way that we are studying their wisdom and we are with them. And cooperatives give us a really uniquely meaningful way to do that, actually. Um, so I am very pleased to be in a position where I'm able to share my knowledge and support, my technical support, to the Denver Mushroom Cooperative um, so that they can, so that we can create the best co-op possible. And uh, representing SPORE, the nonprofit that I work for, Society for Psychedelic Outreach Reform and Education, um, we believe in a future where there's greater healing happening in communities. And we believe that that happens in part through partnership with psychedelic medicines, but also through partnership with the work that we have to do every single day as human beings to heal in these times and that's on us. But with those two things together, right, we dream of a future uh, centered in community sovereignty, where communities actually have the power to determine the way that they want to integrate with psychedelics. So that could look like co-ops and community enterprises, right, community-owned and controlled enterprises, whether that's a healing collective or a production facility or a, distri a distribution or a dispensary, like whatever. <laughs> SPORE stands in solidarity with those efforts because we believe it will benefit the most communities over time. So, um, and what we're doing at SPORE is really interconnected and mycelial in its own way. Um, we really exist to foster community leadership and education and interconnection in communities. And so if you really like 
what I'm sharing about, if you like what we're up to and you want to get more involved in movement building and community building in psychedelic communities, I really encourage you to go to the spore.org slash membership and become a member of SPORE. SPORE is not a co-op, this is not a co-op membership. It's a donor membership. It's You make a donation at whatever level works for you, and then what that kind of allows you is you get the first access to the programs and the education that we're building as SPORE. So there's a lot of benefits involved. You can check it out on our website. Thank you so much for supporting SPORE, for supporting DMC, for supporting this event to happen tonight. I'm so pleased to get to know each of you more and to hear from you about what you want to build in community. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, before we jump in with William, we have one more um, co-founding member. Her name is Elka and she would like to share some of the things that we've been building over the past year. Um, come on up, Elka. Hi everybody, thank you for being here. And um, just briefly what I want to talk about is, oh, um, so I got to um, the Denver co-op, well the mushroom community I should say, through a toxic brain injury and it was the only thing that actually could heal me. There was nothing in medicine, and there's so much loss involved with it. and. The, th the 301 initiative campaign had just started. And so um, I was welcomed and met all these lovely people and here we are today. But one of the things that I found and with this loving family that I have is that I'm a little bit older than everybody else. And so um, I thought, well, um, I would like for other people in my age group and older to um, also have a place where just generationally, there's a, you know, um, just we know each other in that way better, parent, you know, older parenting and all that. So um, anyhow, so I started a group, and it's, it's called, um, the first group I started is 5280, kind of like the altitude here, so from age 50 to 80 plus. And that's been meeting for several months, the first Monday of the month. And I, anybody who'd be interested in participating and um, joining with that, um, let's get your email and um, get on the list. And it's been pretty successful. It's fun. We talk about all kinds of things. It's, it's about learning. It's um, sharing experience and just talking about what things are going on in the world. So that, that, and that's happening at this point the first Monday of every month. And it has been by Zoom, but now we're also going to be meeting in person. So the other group that I've started is called Mystic Rooms, or Mystic Shrooms. And this group is um, primarily for people who, such as myself, who are deeply uh, spiritually seeking, spiritual uh, seekers, people, or um, those individuals who have had spiritual experiences, who want to explore the, the 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 spiritual aspect of ourselves, whatever shows up, and so this group um, is is meeting the second the, the second Tuesday of every month so far. But again, that's also um, open to adjustments and things like that. And then lastly, um, a, a group that I have just gotten together are it's for end of life. Um, people who've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and um, who, um, ha so professionals, for instance, so I'm, a, I'm a, a death doula and I'm a psychotherapist and so for people who have um, gotten a terminal diagnosis to have a, a, a community and professionals are welcome who work with end of life uh, so someone who's ha had a diagnosis at, with six months or less to live, medical aid in dying is also part of this. So any um, professionals um, uh, who are interested in participating in this capacity, also please give me your email and sign up. And I'm also always open to ideas and whatever groups evolve and how they evolve, everyone's a part of that. Um, Nothing's 
rigid and written in stone. There's there's just like the mushroom community, there's there's flexibility in everything. So thank you very much. Alpha and, Lettuce, yes. end of life group meet. The end of life, oh right now we've we've met a couple of times, but we don't have a des exact um, day right now. So we we were plan we met like every other week, but and that can be still every other week, but that's what, you know, just needing to hear what other people can do, what a vote would that would be on that. So, um, and any questions, just ask, yeah, just come and ask me later. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. And okay. Yeah. Oh, I had, <clears throat> brace yourself, um, <laughs> I had a toxic mold exposure, uh, uh, Stachybotrys and Aspergillus and the others, I mean, really bad. I couldn't remember my name. I couldn't say my name. And so brain swelling, um, instant disability, I got, that's hard <laughs> to get that, but with that, excuse me? Well, there was there was really nothing. Um, you just you live with that you live with that disability, and um, I I um, had you know I, I had before that when I couldn't remember my name uh, even happened. I knew something wasn't right, and I was I was researching you know um, depression and all these things, alternative um, uh, help for for those types of things going on and mushrooms oh, and um, psychedelics would come up and so I started looking into that and it just so happened and I mean my dog died from this um, uh, just so happened right at that time that I learned about the 301 campaign and then learned all the other things that have come along with it and um, uh, it yeah my, my speech has come back about 85 percent and I can be here and I can drive and it's been wonderful. And I'm glad to talk with you more later if you'd like. Oh, okay, yeah, that's great. Okay, well, thank you, Elka. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the co-op and, and what we're getting off the ground here. Uh, I'll be hanging out uh, throughout the meeting and afterwards to collect emails so I can send you more information and you can get more involved as you are comfortable and are called to do. Uh, and now I would like to welcome William Padilla Brown. He is a founder of Mycosymbiotics, a team of dedicated environmental regeneration enthusiasts who seek to support local ecology and community as citizen scientists. Since 2015, Microsymbiotics has focused on collecting native Pennsylvania strains of gourmet and medicinal mushrooms from the wild to study and control environments. William explores the space around contemporary rituals and modern urban shamanism. He's a leading voice in the greater mushroom community and has written for Fungi Magazine, was featured in Fantastic Fungi, Vice, BuzzFeed, The Verge, Outside Magazine, Civil Eats, Public Goods, the book One Earth, and he enjoys researching, rapping, and singing. Um, he's here with his lady Lydia and their son Leo, and he holds a permaculture design certificate from the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. Please welcome William. That's crazy. Welcome, welcome. It's good to be back in Colorado. Let me get up a presentation for y'all here. Where'd it go? There we at. All right, I hope y'all can see some of that action. But yeah, I'm Will. Um, and I just got into town last night from Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, Pennsylvania vibes all the way. Um, yeah, and I'm repping it real hard. Gotta love it. Um, that's where all the all the magic's been happening. And uh, yeah, right before here, we were in Pennsylvania for three days, and before that, I was in Maine 
uh, experimenting with a protocol I developed from uh, studying some old research papers from 2010 on um, DNA sexing cannabis in early developmental stages uh, so that farmers can sex their plants and remove males uh, and uh, not waste time with uh, water and soil. Could save a lot of money. Um, so I've been working on refining that protocol and uh, so I was spending a couple days up in Maine playing around with that in a legal setting. Um, so hopefully we can get that uh, to more farmers um, and alleviate some economic stress um, and propel us all into the future a little bit faster. Um, but yeah, just been in the mix of things, you know. Um, I guess I'll just uh, I'll start with the mushrooms because that's how I got here. This is how I secured uh, resources enough to fling myself into whatever level of weird science this is now. Um, so yeah, mycosymbiosis. Um, I founded a company called Mycosymbiotics in 2015 off of a psychedelic experience I had where I came to the understanding that homeostasis could only be achieved via symbiosis with local systems, both ecological and social. Um, I recognized that without um, coming into balance with the society around me, the community around me, and the ecology around me, then I wouldn't be able to find balance in myself. Um, so I started to learn about the organisms around me. I started to learn about the people around me. I started to interact with the people around me. Um, I even tried to run for mayor when I was like 21 or 22. Um, and I engaged with the local politics. I engaged with the local uh, uh, businesses and corporations and things like that. Um, and found a lot of successes in it. And I found a lot of successes in mimicking mycelial archetypes. Um, I recognized in psychedelic experiences that the human being is the ultimate scientific tool designed by nature and our linguistic capabilities are inhibited by utilizing auditory linguistic structures because we're more inclined to understand symbolic uh, linguistic structures which nature is full of. It is a living story full of symbols. Um, and Terence McKenna said it quite well that uh, DNA is protein syntax uttering itself into existence and we're the ultimate tool to be reading said utterances. Um, so uh, I took it upon myself to engage uh, with the environment to be able to learn uh, to speak that language that is universal. Um, and I found that mushrooms were very, very helpful in doing this. Um, so yeah, uh, finding mushrooms in central Pennsylvania was interesting. Um, Pennsylvania is known as like the mushroom capital of the United States. Uh, because there's a lot of mushroom farms in, in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, produces Kennett Square, yeah, produces most of uh, the mushrooms for the United States. Actually, millions and millions of pounds are produced there on a weekly basis. Um, but where I lived in central Pennsylvania, there was no mushroom farms. Uh, none for about a 60 or 70 mile radius outside of where I was living. Um, and uh, yeah, the not only is there, were there no mushroom farms, but there was... I mean, one metaphysical shop, maybe a couple yoga spots, and one health food store, no organic sections in any of the grocery stores. Like, when I tripped out, I was like, what the heck, where am I? Like, there is nothing to facilitate any of this experience at all, at all. Like, actually, what I'm doing is quite disapproved of by everyone around me. Um, but I went outside looking all weird with crystals dangling off of me and started selling mushrooms at farmer's markets in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. And all the good old boys rolled down in their trucks out of the mountains and looked at me and assumed I was some liberal brown person. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was met with all sorts of racial slurs and political arguments um, where I never met anybody back with an argument. I always met people back where they were at, just like the psychedelics did with me. Um, and for that reason, I was able to have a lot of really good dialogue with the community and actually have changed the community in quite a very, uh, quite a large way, uh, quite a dramatic way as far as uh, ecological literacy in the area. Um, and I got all those good old boys to buy my mushrooms. Um, so you got to know how to grow. You got to know to grow. And I think that growing mushrooms is one of the best ways to um, alleviate economic stress, which is one of the best ways to bring uh, the human attention into the present moment where it's not diverted um, in working for, uh, to fulfill needs. 
um, all of our needs should be met um, once we recognize our uh, our local uh, society and our local ecology. Um, we can all uh, achieve that homeostasis in our community together um, and fulfill our roles um, as ecological beings in this in this system. Um, so I'm going to skip through some of these things here. Um, so back in Pennsylvania, since since I was like 19 or 20 years old, I've been teaching classes at my home. Um, and I, I found this to be very effective um, for the students because um, from that home setting, they're able to see things that are very replicable. Whereas if they were to visit a large mushroom facility or a larger farm, they might be disencouraged by the um, scale of things or the uh, cost and price tag on a lot of the equipment that comes with it. Um, and until my friends uh, from Fungi for the People and my friends from like Smugtown Mushrooms and Radical Mycology started um, teaching classes around the country, there wasn't too much that was offered outside of the realms of large mushroom farms for education around uh, cultivation. Um, so we've been bringing people into the home setting and educating them on how to cultivate mushrooms uh, for years and in doing so have educated hundreds and hundreds of mushroom farmers. Um, and we also, <laughs> thank you, uh, we, we do this um, um, and in the most um, conscious ways. Um, a lot of people are like fighting against the environment and cultivating mushrooms in indoor settings and uh, um, putting a lot of uh, energy um, and electricity in Pennsylvania, it's mostly coal and nuclear, um, into modulating environments to be able to control them to, for mushroom production whenever the environment outside is usually pretty good for uh, cultivating mushrooms. And also a lot of people around the country are bringing in materials and substrates from faraway places, which costs carbon to get those materials from faraway places to grow them on. When there's abundance of agricultural waste products and urban waste products in every single urban environment in the United States that could be utilized for uh, mushroom cultivation. Mushroom cultivation. Um, Where'd my water go? Oh, there we go. That hash, man, sheesh. Um, so yeah, we've been cultivating mushrooms on straw, coffee grounds, uh, sawdust, cardboard, whatever we can get um, to be able to turn waste into protein. That's how I got where I am. Um, I know it wasn't mentioned um, in, my, uh, um, in my description or my biological description, uh, biography. Is that what they call it? Yep, yeah. I'm such a nerd, it's too weird. Um, uh, but I dropped out of high school when I was 16 because it was interfering with my education. Um, and I took it upon myself to learn the things that I thought would be beneficial. Um, and as a high school dropout in the United States with the color of my skin and having a kid when I was 20 years old, it wasn't really easy to get jobs that provided a lot of resources. Um, so I had to figure out how to grow mushrooms on trash because I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> and, and because I figured it out that way, it's so replicable. I've been able to teach this to people all over the place. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we do all sorts of lab skills as well. Um, so it's not just rudimentary, um, you know, cardboard cultivation or low-tech cultivation of mushrooms or anything like that. Um, over the years, I was able to acquire laboratory equipment from college auctions. Uh, a lot of colleges throw away equipment whenever they get new equipment, so I was able to acquire lots of equipment that way um, and build up a lab. And through YouTube, and I took one class uh, with Fungi for the People in 2015, um, and I read a couple books. I was able to teach myself microbiology and uh, start doing this stuff in the lab. And, and, and teaching myself that way, it was also very replicable because I learned it from a non-academic standpoint. So I didn't have the jargon of the, the ivory towers instilled in me. I was, I was speaking still the same language of the people and not utilizing all of these technical terms that would disconnect uh, uh, an academic person from your everyday person that just wants to learn how to grow mushrooms. Um, so for anybody that wants to uh, grow mushrooms, um, where you're gonna start is obtaining a culture. And as we start to um, have a whole new um, population of, of mycoliterate uh, individuals in our country, um, there'll be more individuals that will know what species of mushrooms are more adapted to which environments. 
Um, so Psilocybe cubensis, uh, for, for those of you that are interested in those, um, is, has been taken to cultivation readily because it grows so well inside. Where there are plentiful outdoor uh, Psilocybe mushrooms that will take very well to these environments, I'm sure. Um, and that's for all of you to discover as recognizing yourself as uh, scientists as well. Um, so we can obtain cultures from clones, spores, culture distributors. Um, I got on TikTok last year uh, because I saw how many people were using it. And I like to stay where, where the attention is um, because everybody's attention is diverted. And that's why nobody's paying attention to themselves. That's why we're all unhealthy. That's why our community is unhealthy. Everybody's looking for something that's like not worth looking at. Um, but it's good to stay where the attention is. Um, because it's easy to get people's attention. It's, I mean, it's so easy to sell stuff to people. Um, so I went on there and I did the little dances. Um, I danced with a chicken um, and, and a hoe or a rake in my hand. And I just walked into the frame with a chicken and I like danced around a little bit. And then I woke up the next day and there was like 100,000 views on it. And then the next day it was like a quarter million views on it. And then BuzzFeed was hitting me up like the next week. And then Vice was hitting me up the next week. And then that just propelled a lot of uh, influence moving forward to be able to spread this stuff. And the reason that I say this is because now there's like 100,000 kids that are looking at TikTok every day and moms and dads. And I'm sure plenty of you guys have spent hours on TikTok. I mean, it happens. It happens. But the people that are looking at it now are able to see quality content um, and the reason that I brought it up is because I just shared a series on there on how to clone mushrooms from your local Asian mall uh, or local Asia market and I just went in there and bought the agar packets from in there and bought some mushrooms from in there and bought some coconut water and mixed the coconut water with the agar and then cloned the mushrooms on there and I put it all on there for people to figure out how to do it themselves um, and because it's so short I always link people back to like videos. I have a YouTube channel with hundreds of videos on it for people to go back for descriptions and things like that to be able to follow for instructions. Um, but yeah, aside from that, uh, we do distribute cultures out of Pennsylvania. As it was mentioned, we have been collecting native strains for quite some time um, and working with uh, mostly cordyceps, but we do have a wide variety of other strains and we're working with um, some interesting entomopathogenic um, species or uh, mushrooms that are beneficial for, uh, or mushrooms that uh, you eat insects as their, as their food source is, is the best way to describe that. And, uh, um, and we're working with them. And my buddy actually is uh, going to go drag a pillowcase through the grass tomorrow to go get some ticks um, to put in the Petri dish because we got some Bavaria bassiana and it can eat ticks. So we're trying to figure out how to like make a protocol for like killing ticks with fungus so people don't have to spray nothing and don't have to be worried about Lyme disease and stuff like that. Um, and this is stuff anybody can do. I mean, we all have our own ecological uh, uh, vectors, our own ecological issues that we have to deal with. Um, and there's nobody better than yourself to figure out how to deal with it. I got Lyme's disease. Who better to figure out how to get rid of the ticks, right? Um, so yeah, we do a lot of culture work in the laboratory. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem kind of technical. And I know a lot of you probably have no interest in doing any of this lab work uh, at all. Um, but it doesn't have to be like this, but I do think it's important um, to kind of cover this for anybody that is interested in um, cultivating mushrooms to bring uh, economic revitalization so then you can move forward to the really cool stuff that I'm going to show after this. Um, so hang on tight. Um, but yeah, we do distribute cultures and a lot of people do distribute cultures in liquid form. And I do think that liquid culture is the future for mycology. It's way cleaner and it's way easier for a lot of individuals to get into it versus uh, agar or petri dish uh, uh, work. And it eliminates a lot of steps because not everybody needs to have a culture lab. That's where we're going to start recognizing the co-op form is going to be so much better. It's like, why? Why do when I drive down the street in Pennsylvania, does every single person have a riding lawnmower? Why, don't, why doesn't just one block have a riding lawnmower? That was so much carbon to bring all them things over from China. And like every single person's wasting gas. Every single person thing's gonna break down and have to invest in it more. Why don't y'all just have one for each block? Everybody takes care of it and y'all can all use it. Like, it's the same thing. Like, why does everybody have a HEPA filter now? Like, why does everybody have a whole lab in their house? Like, why don't y'all just come together as a community instead of everybody having to invest so much money in this? Not everybody has to do everything now. And like, 
a lot of people ask like why do i do so many things because not only do i do mushrooms but i cultivate algae and we do uh, additive manufacturing with 3d printers and we uh, uh do molecular biology and like you know the list goes on and on and like why did i do all those things because i needed all of those things to perform the functions that i'm here to do and it didn't exist whenever i figured out who i was and what i was here to do i was living in a place and a time that the tools weren't there for me. So I had to ma man manifest the tools. But if I was in an area that the tools were already manifest, I would have been able to engage in a way, uh, uh, in, in way better and not have to ex extend so much of my own time and my own resources into it. So you guys are in a really great position where you're already talking about this. Like, not everybody has to have a lab in their house. Like, y'all can have a community lab together. I've seen so many great examples of them. Uh, Counterculture Laboratories over in Oakland is one of the great, the greatest examples I've seen of it. There's, there's a team over there that, that is able to just go in there and utilize this lab space and they've been uh, open sourcing insulin. Yeah, crazy, right? The things that you can do with science, everybody can, anybody can do science. I taught myself molecular biology in two months. All I did w was do psychedelics. <laughs> um, so this is what my lab used to look like. Um, and uh, you know, it, it looks pretty similar now, but it's like inside of a grow tent because we're in a different building, which we insulated with hemp. It's pretty cool, y'all should check that out. Um, on the internet. Um, and I know some of y'all are just looking at this like, nah, I don't need any of this. When is it gonna get cool? Um, and some of y'all don't even, like a lot of y'all will never even need to have any of that like extensive laboratory knowledge or anything like that to be able to participate in the community. There's gonna be a lot of different offshooting branches of how this all will operate. Um, but even for like doing clean work and stuff like that, it could be very simple. Um, I've done a lot of clean work from like still air boxes and stuff like that, which I'm sure a lot of a lot of y'all have started out with as well. Um, so I'm gonna run through some of this stuff, um, you know, all sorts of different sterilization techniques and uh, materials utilized. Um, but uh, here's some here's some interesting things that I would like to talk about. I don't know how well um, outdoor cultivation would work in an environment as such, you know, it is pretty dry here and, and hot. Um, but I do think that there's a, there's a lot of potential for outdoor cultivation and I would like to share some of the um, successes that we had. And I think that um, figuring out where the microclimates exist and, and uh, um, I don't even know what's the best word, you just utilizing those, um, I, think, I think it's, I don't know the best way to even explain what I'm trying to think, like we have to, consciously utilize our spaces instead of just popping up and putting buildings wherever like there's there's spaces that are like producing specific microclimates that are beneficial for you know growing some mushrooms outdoors like why why put a building there when you could just put some mushrooms there um that's the kind of idea i'm trying to get across right now um but yeah these are some cool uh strafaria mushrooms that i found uh on the side of the road in pennsylvania i used to have a, a a sticker on the back of my car that says I break for mushrooms. Um, but I got pulled over for that, so I took that off. But I do pull off the uh, side of the road real quick when I see mushrooms like this. It's amazing. That mushroom's like the size of my torso, and there's a bunch of them. Um, somebody pushed some wood chips off the side of the road. And this is Strafaria rugosa annulata. Um, anybody that does have a garden and waters their garden, this one is, you know, your best friend. You could put that in there, and it's just going to come up whenever you water your garden. It's going to break down wood chips. Um, really ideal for any amount of wood chip um, mass that is collected. I know there's like electrical companies or different um, trimming companies that end up with lots of wood chips. It is a great resource for cultivating mushrooms. Um, and outdoor mushroom cultivation could also be utilized for uh, microremediation. Um, and we've also seen a lot of, let's see, uh, it's not gonna come up yet. Uh, we've also seen a lot of really interesting microremediation potentials with soil psilocybe mushrooms like uh, Psilocybe ovoidiocystidiata like we have out in the East Coast. Um, we've actually seen potentials for it uh, fighting off uh, parasitic fungi like uh, honey mushrooms. So lots of really cool stuff like that. Um, but microremediation, so for in this picture, uh, we were backfilling for a farm that was um, an herb farm for medicinal herbs that was underneath a road where the rainwater would run off the, the dirt of the road down into the farm. Uh, so they backfilled and, and filled it up with a bunch of spent mushroom spawn, which as more mushroom cultivators start coming up, it's gonna be something that you're gonna have that you're gonna need to figure out what you're gonna wanna do with it. And it is a resource, just like the materials that you put into it was a resource before. Um, so we've been able to utilize this to create biological filters um, to, to be able to filter out contaminants on their way down um, as the water comes into the farm. Um, and 
Microremediation is an experimental science, so a lot of these things are just not uh, readily uh, replicable. Um, uh, it's all, it's a lot of it is environmental based, but luckily there's a lot of uh, citizen scientists that are putting out uh, information online and sharing uh, information open source for people to be able to work off of. All right, let me get through here a little bit more. Um, these these methods of cultivation are also very uh, would hold very well outside, and I would like to see more individuals get into philosophy cultivation like this one here um, with buried materials. Um, this is this is something that works well in a lot of uh, Asian farms, and it work and this would work well in areas that are a little bit more dry because there is a uh, more constant temperature and moisture level in the soils. Um, and we've been seeing really good success with this. What's underneath those uh, Rocks and sand for water to go down to the bottom. Um, and then we can just put shade cloth instead of that plastic. Um, I don't even know what this is called. I just watch a lot of foreign YouTube videos and I see people do stuff and then I just re do it. And so what we did, we just dug a hole and put sand in the bottom of it and put rocks in the bottom of it and put a bunch of mushroom spawn in it. And I've seen it done like... Let's see, like this, you see this guy doing it. This is my friend Rusty. Uh, he's, putting in, he's putting the spawn into these logs and burying the logs and then putting some extra substrate on top of it and then completely covering it. Um, and that's, what's, that's with Foliota Nameko. But this would also work with wood-loving psilocybe species, which I would love to see more people do this kind of stuff outdoors. It just takes controlling a small microclimate. Um, was there something else that I wanted? Oh, th yeah, this stuff. This is really cool for, for individuals, you know, just like really low tech, no tech. Um, taking pieces of cardboard that have mushrooms, uh, mycelium growing on it, and shoving it in between pieces of wood. Like you can literally just like ax into a, 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 I mean, you don't want to do it to a live tree, but ax into a piece of, uh, um, you know, fi uh, a log, cut out a, a nice wedge, stuff some myceliated cardboard in and shove the wedge back together or just like slice your wood up into pieces and shove cardboard in between it that has mycelium on it. Great way to grow your mycelium out. And if anybody wants to like any of the little techniques that I mentioned along the way, I have a video for how to do every single step along the way on my YouTube channel, Apex Grower, if anybody wants to like follow up afterwards on any of these techniques. Um, so yeah, um, I've done a lot of urban agriculture, uh, utilizing wood chips to create soil in environments where, there, where the soil is either contaminated or um, not capable of producing um, healthy vegetables. And a lot of people you know, doubted my abilities to be able to grow healthy vegetables and wood chips. Um, but as you can see, my gardens are green, for those of you that could see. Um, and it's just mushrooms breaking down the wood chips to feed the, the the uh, plants. And when you start to do these kinds of things, um, you're, partic you're actively participating in creating environments. Um, so when I have the mushrooms in there, it, um, and earthworms, earthworms can smell mm, mycelium from I think like 10 feet away, which is like a ridiculous amount of, of, of distance for a small cr uh, creature. Um, so the earthworms come, um, other little beetles come, spiders come to eat the other little bugs, then uh, slugs start to come in, which I don't really necessarily like around my mushrooms. But then birds come around and you, know, you start to create whole environments. Um, and then as the plants start to grow up and shade out your, your wood chips and you water your plants or it rains, then you, got, you start to get your mushrooms around that rapidly break down the soil and turn into delicious edible food stuffs. Um, here we have some golden oyster mushroom cultivation. Um, and there's my buddy Leo uh, with some king oyster. This is passive cultivation. So this um, is taking advantage of other mushroom farms. Um, so there's a lot of mushroom farms that are producing on commercial scale that only will produce a couple rounds of their mushrooms. Um, and then they'll toss them. And they'll see they'll have huge piles usually around their farm of spawn that's just producing mushrooms all over the place. Um, so what we do um, is we intercept this spawn uh, before it gets composted, and then we put it in shady areas. And then when it rains or when it, it gets watered, uh, we get mushrooms in a very passive way. Um, and then it breaks down into soil that we use to revitalize and build soil and make more gardens. Um, this is reishi done the same way with buried logs, just growing right out of the ground. Um, you know, you can you can grow. This was like this was like half of this pavement all the way down. It was reishi the whole way. That's just as much as I got in the picture. 
Um, so we'll get into some indoor stuff. This is where I think more of you guys will thrive here in this environment. Um, I've been doing a lot of cultivation classes for a long time, and I end up with a lot of like bags of coffee grounds or bags of little shredded paper and stuff like that with mycelium growing on it. And then I'll find mushrooms like growing in my car and uh, out of a little sandwich bag or like growing in a cabinet or something out of a cup. Um, it's a it's a common thing. Um, but yeah, it's super, super simple. It also shows how simple it is to just get mushrooms to grow. That's mushrooms growing legit on coffee grounds that I probably did in a class this size with everybody with dirty hands putting everything together. And people think that they need to be sterile to do mushroom cultivation. Um, here's one of my old mushroom farms that I had set up um, in a shed. Um, so it goes, you can see how simple it, it is really. I mean, I just went, I went in there and put up plastic on the walls and was able to start producing mushrooms. Uh, I also painted the floors with um, um, weatherproof paint so that I didn't damage the floors from all, the amount of water in there and I could go in and like squeegee water out. Um, and I was able to produce uh, massive amounts of high value mushrooms. So that was the other thing. Um, this is all for economic stress alleviation. So you guys can acquire lots of tools and stuff like that to bring your co-ops to like higher heights. There's like a whole new world of engagement with these kinds of things. Um, and, and everybody can get a slice of the pie. There's so much really the, to, to explore. And what, what I'm finding exciting right now, and I don't have pictures of it, unfortunately, um, is every, like, I mean, my buddies in New Jersey right now are cultivating Fistulina hepatica, which has limited record of cultivation at all. This is the beefsteak mushroom that can be eaten raw. That's a whole new culinary uh, mushroom. It's a saprophytic mushroom. So right now we have mycologists that are becoming literate. We have individuals around the country that are becoming literate, able to talk to each other on the internet and bounce ideas back and forth really quickly. And now we have people that are cultivating mushrooms that have no history of cultivation, like the Fistulina hepatica that my friends at Garden State Mushrooms in New Jersey have been cultivating. And then also Ischnoderma resinosum, which I've been sharing cultures of out of my lab. We cultivated it indoors and my buddy cultivated in 90 degrees summer where it usually where it usually grows in the fall in the wild and this is a mushroom that is edible and tastes like skirt steak and has almost no research on its medicinal values so also as people are starting to make these cooperatives and acquire laboratory equipment together you put yourselves in the best position to be able to research all these mushrooms that we know are safe to eat that has no record of medicinal anything like there's so much room to, for discovery so I mean like those two off rip, and then like Globifomies Gravio lens. Uh, my, my buddies at uh, uh, Mush Love Mushrooms in Virginia have been cultivating that one. No record at all of medicinal value, but it's a polypore, and we know that all mushrooms have uh, immunological polysaccharides at least. So there's that's a basis to start off, and there's people been consuming it. So like we already know that you can consume it safely. We already know that it's cultivatable. What if we find out that it's like kills? A, a certain type of cancer cell or what if we find out that it's like super effective against like malaria or something like that and nobody knows because there's no research done on it but now we are acquiring the tools to do so and we can just start popping them out like this in a little shed um i keep good connections with chefs because they pay the bills um happy chefs it means that i don't have to stress about my car payments and stuff like that um because you know you got to have like um you gotta have contingencies. If you wanna keep doing the cool stuff that you wanna do, there always has to be some backup of thing that like in case what the cool thing you're doing is not making money. Cause like until the co-op creates enough of a community where you can detach and with decentralized models and decentralized means, which I have tons of information about that on the internet as well. Um, I have a whole YouTube video on decentralized economic systems. Uh, I don't even want to let my mind go there right now. Um, but y'all should start talking about that as cooperatives as well. Um, I'm sorry? Lots of lion's mane mushrooms. Yeah, he's holding lots of lion's mane mushrooms. Everybody loves these. They're high value. They're high dollar. Um, they're neurologically active. They're highly bioactive. We've been making concentrated extracts of this stuff that is highly bioactive to the point that people feel like they are high when they're consuming it at a concentrated dose. It is fully just like neuro lubricate. Did, or, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, I, I 
don't know and I forgot about that honestly life's been so crazy that I forgot about how crazy everything has been at, as it goes I just get back into my lab and like oh this is where I left off and get back to it uh, but we got Wolfaporia I want to say Wolfaporia it's related to Wolfaporia or a mushroom called Fuling in China that is like mostly polysaccharide and it has record of Native American use where it was called something like a Tuckahoe and um, most people reference it as a bread, but when you cut that thing open, it's just pure white, and it's like mostly complex polysaccharide that it, when you put it in your mouth feels like a starch, and it's like highly bioactive and medicinal in its own. Um, yeah, it produces a sclerotia. It does produce a mushroom, but it's more rare to find, kind of like chaga. Like chaga will produce that like weird like lumpy thing that people are debating on what it is, and it also produces a mushroom, which is more rare to see. Um, uh, the Wolfaporia does produce a mushroom, but it produces a sclerotia, and sclerotia are beneficial because they're like these underground forms that mushrooms make to uh, store their energy to withstand harsh environments, and because of that, they fill it with medicinal goodness and, and energy for them to live off of. Um, so there's that one, um, and we're trying to identify it. I've just been in and out of the lab, so I haven't been able to like get all my DNA organized accordingly. Um, which I'll talk about even what that means. Uh, but I, I, I do DNA barcoding and identify all of everything to make sure that we're pr pr doing proper science so that people take this seriously. Um, and uh, so that, it, so that you know, it's effective. And um, um, so we're gonna figure out what that is. We know it's edible. It, we know it's a, it's a relative of the one that's being cultivated and consumed in China. And this also um, brings a whole new level to North American cultivation where we can start utilizing pine species uh, for, for large scale mushroom cultivation where we've only been using hardwoods because the wolfaporia grows on pine and we can grow like body sized coconuts of pure polysaccharide, um, which is gonna be insane. Uh, and then uh, Pleurotus tuber regium. That one produces a sclerotia that my buddy in uh, Keswick, Virginia, what is it? Uh, Sharondale mushrooms. He experimented with cultivating that one on grains. It produced massive potato-sized sclerotia that are highly medicinal with some novel compounds. I, I recommend just go reference that. Um, Pleurotus tuber regium. I don't know if there's a common name for it. Um, maybe just come find me afterwards and I'll share it. How, but that one is definitely look at that one. Um, and then cultivating, uh, you know, pretty novel species like my Taki. If anybody can start cultivating these, these ones sell at high price all year, especially when they're off season. Um, when they're in season in um, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, we find so much in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio area that we literally supply the whole country with maitake. Like you can go out on any given day and find like a hundred pounds of these where I live um, when they're in season. And because of that, nobody should be going hungry. Um, but when they're not in season, you can sell them for a really high price. Um, so yeah, this is what the mushroom farm used to look like when I first started. As I mentioned, it was hard to acquire resources. Um, so I couldn't even afford the shelves to grow the mushrooms on. Um, so I just hung them from strings from the ceiling because I saw some guy um, do it in a video from India. Um, and I gained a lot of inspiration and techniques from watching videos from uh, Southern Asian countries um, that didn't industrialize um, because they're put in a position where they don't have like Home Depot to go to or they don't have the resources to be able to create these big bright mushroom farms with shiny new toys in them. Um, and they have to, you know, put up some bamboo or put some tarps over it and grow mushrooms that way. And because of that, they've been able to grow the same mushrooms like we're growing, you know, pumping hundreds of dollars into controlling lights and AC and all this kind of stuff and some like tarps and bamboo and stuff. So why put all that extra money into it when you could just do that? So I just hung my mushrooms from the ceiling. And as the mushrooms started to... Uh, you know, pay for themselves, then I started to utilize them to pay for the equipment. After I did the initial investment into the, 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 uh, into mycosymbiotics, I let the mushrooms propel it and then everything else propel it afterwards. Um, and then eventually, you know, I expanded into like what most people would consider what looks like a mushroom farm and quickly found myself with hundreds of pounds of mushrooms and, and creating new relationships with people. Um, 
having that many mushrooms and not ways to sell them and I wasn't really business savvy, it put me in a position where I made a lot of connections with individuals and started doing lots of trade and barter, um, which goes along the decentralized uh, thing. So where, where this started to be beneficial is um, I was able to help people that were hungry um, and I was able to acquire things that I needed that I didn't have to then spend my money on. Um, so that worked out really well. Um, and then I also did find a lot of accounts to actually make some fiat uh, paper from as well. Um, um, and then, you know, we get beautiful harvests. And this is something that I want to share with more and more people as we go along. Like, when when this can come from just, like, you know, a little bit of sawdust or coffee grounds. And, like, I mean, I got all those oyster mushrooms, which you can literally grow on coffee grounds or sawdust or paper. I got the spirulina, which you can grow on, like, uh I mean, nutrient salts that, or brewery uh, uh, wastewater, or uh, um, uh, biogas effluent, um, and then all sorts of wild forage greens. It just takes a little bit of knowledge of, of, of your environment to be able to provide these kinds of things for yourself, which you know provides that uh, economic alleviation so that you can engage in a different way. Um, so we've had all sorts of experiments with different mushroom cultivation. This one is from a really great example at the Radix Center in Albany, New York. If anybody ever has the opportunity to go up there, they offer really amazing classes. I took the regenerative urban sustainability training with them back in 2015. Um, they have kids that go around the whole city of Albany, acquire coffee grounds from the cafes. They put them in bins like this, and they inoculate them with oyster mushrooms, grow the oyster mushrooms, and then sell them. Um, really great model. They have animals there. They grow algae there. They have a big, beautiful greenhouse, um, and it's all run by uh, kids mostly at this point. Um, yeah, this is just some pretty pictures at this point. Um, if anybody is doing composting or has any other level of uh, urban ag or farming, um, agaricus could come into play as another uh, beneficial mushrooms to start mushroom to start cultivating. Um, and this one is a good accumulator of minerals um, for uh, replacing mineral supplements and things like that. Um, Bioprospecting. Um, is anybody here part of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society? How is there, what, what? Yeah, I mean, but like that's wild that like this is a mushroom meeting and there's not that many people that is with the local mushroom club. Y'all need to get with it. Um, there's a Denver one. There's a Denver one? Oh. Wait, how did I not know this? How many of y'all are part of the Denver one? Wait, wait, that's still not enough. All right, so bioprospecting. I, I definitely recommend engaging with your local mushroom club so that you can start to know and become literate of the, uh, your neighbors. Your, your, your fungal neighbors, so you can know what's around and you can start to prospect for the ones that could be beneficial for your, you and your community. Um, so before I move forward, what does this look like symbolically, um, the thing I'm holding in my hands? Anybody could just say it out loud. Cauliflower. Cauliflower. What was it? Brain. I heard a couple brains. Um, has anybody ever heard of the doctrine of signatures? All right. Um, the doctrine of signatures, um, shows how different uh, organisms in nature grow in forms that are beneficial for different functions uh, or different organs or things like that. Like like um, the lion's mane, it's good for the neural network and it shows itself in like symbolically like a brain or like the reishi looks like a liver and it, sh and it shows itself um, in a form almost looks like a liver or like the cordyceps is good for the adrenal glands and it, and it shows itself in a form that almost looks like adrenal. Um, so it's interesting how nature does this, and again, goes back to understanding nature as a symbolic system, and understanding how we can start to communicate it with communicate with it on on different levels. Um, here we have some very large lines. Main um, there's been all sorts of different uh, interesting research done with this uh, for cognitive capacity in conjunction with psilocybin. Um, my buddy Alan told me a story of a friend that was in a car accident. Um, and was paralyzed and was told that he would never be able to walk again and was able to utilize uh, lion's mane with psilocybin in conjunction um, and now he could drive cars and walk again. Um, I definitely recommend messaging Alan Rockefeller and he can actually connect you with the individual that could tell that story on a, di on a deeper level. Um, but these are really powerful compounds. These are really powerful bioactive compounds. And I don't know. I mean, I, I get overwhelmed in, in 
and trying to understand the complexities. I kind of just go with the flow of it. Um, this is one of my friends um, that I've been visiting for about four years. Um, and it's provided me and my family and the community with lots and lots of medicine. Um, and it's far up this hackberry tree that's surrounded by poison ivy. Um, so I'm never worried about anybody else getting it because I don't get poison ivy. And I think everybody else would probably be afraid to get up in there. Um, but it's really interesting to see how bountiful nature is. Um, here we have Heresium Americana, more of a cascading Heresium. Um, ooh, I, I forgot to mention something for the nerds. Um, this one in my hand, does anybody know this species of this one? Uh, this one is Heresium Coralloides. Has anybody heard of this before, the coral tooth Heresium? All right, so Heresium Coralloides has some interesting research right now on it, um, showing that it has three novel compounds, uh, Coralosin A, B, and C, um, which are also neurologically active um, in similar ways to the aranecines and Heresiones found in lion's mane, um, but they're all different. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting to explore this uh, further um, because... The neural medicine, once we kind of get ourselves in alignment, is what's going to take us to the next level of being able to um, engage our consciousness with the biocomputer um, for higher levels of, of, comp of, of function and processing. Otherwise, your, your nervous system will run hot. Your brain will run too hot. Um, so we need to be able to lubricate ourselves with these kinds of things from the inside, um, as well as cannabinoids. But that's a whole other story. But if anybody's interested, um, Look on my Instagram, and I posted a couple of days ago um, this post of, called the Truffled Vole Theory um, that I've been working on. It's very rudimentary right now, um, but it goes in depth, and I shared an article um, on how the CB1 receptor for cannabinoids led to advanced neural networks and brains. And the research that starts with the Truffled Vole Theory, which just to be brief, uh, talks about how all mammals that survived the mass extinction that killed off the dinosaurs because they were small and ground-dwelling mammals had very intimate relationships with truffles. And modern research shows that truffles produce anandamide and other cannabinoids and have an, end an endocannabinoid system themselves. Um, and the research that I've been doing into truffles proves even more that they would be uh, promoting of an advanced neural network, and they also induce adult neurogenesis, which means any species that was evolving with truffles as their primary food source, which a lot of mammals still today, truffles are their only and primary food source, um, would be living in stages of adult neurogenesis where they, from childbirth until the time they die, never have a point in time where their brain stops making new connections. Um, and the research is even showing that these truffles controlled their behavioral patterns, their sexual patterns, their hibernation patterns. And I mean, that led to all mammals that evolved out of those holes and became masters of their environment. Um, so I think that some of this research and understanding how we can utilize um, these compounds that we have found in nature to be very beneficial for um, neurogenesis and beneficial for neural health um, can really um, usher in this, um, this, um, this building, this building of a new tomorrow, this 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 uh, building uh, of a, of a new cosmology of consciousness, where we're we're discovering the new linguistic tools and coming together as a community to understand how we can dock higher levels of consciousness onto our communities, onto our own bodies, um, which takes you know higher levels of neural capacity and neural work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could show you guys pictures of mushrooms forever. Um, I, I think in, in coming here and connecting with this, from this like stone soup, like what does everybody have to throw in the pot kind of, um, mentality, I think that it's really important, um, for people to just focus on themselves. Um, because as Travis said, he's what he's throwing into the pot. I mean, he also said that like he's throwing you know, those really nice flow hoods into the pot, which is awesome, and you guys are really lucky. But, like, that's a big, that's a big and powerful thing to recognize ourselves um, as what we're bringing to the table um, and recognizing our birthright to, to be unapologetically ourselves um, and recognize that we are part of nature. And I think that is something that has been um, a veil, you know, 
over our eyes that 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 human action and human implications are unnatural but humans are the ultimate scientific tool designed by nature to bring nature into higher evolution and our dna is just as much pr providing ecological function as the trees that we sit under as the squirrels that plant the acorns as the grass that grows as the flowers that bloom as the as the birds and the pollinators that pollinate them our dna is just as much an ecological function and it is up to us to recognize who we are and what is our ecological function i i did it for myself and that's how i ended up here and i hope that more individuals and I, i'm so happy that there's the time and the space for people to be able to to do this together and talk about it together and move forward together to recognize you, what, what you can do that nobody else can do. What, is your, what are your passions and what do you bring to the table? What are your feelings and why do you feel them? Why are you inclined to do these things that other people aren't? And explore those things. And you're gonna figure out all sorts of amazing things that you can do that nobody else can because you're a unique individual. And all of us have something so beautiful to bring to this soup. And at the end of the day, it's gonna be so much fun when we get to look at each other and be present with each other and not be distracted by, I have to go to work tomorrow, or I need this thing, or I need that thing, when we can sit down with each other and say, what can you do? Like, I, I see you, like, what can you do? Like, show me. I wanna see every single one of you. I wanna see all of the beautiful things that you can do. Like, it, like, to be able to live on a planet with so many people, it's such an amazing opportunity. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is great. I, I think in, in my quest to achieve homeostasis, it went exactly where I thought it would, but so fast, to the point where now I'm able to navigate the world as the global community. Like, it was my, my community first, and, I, and I, I figured it out where I was never hungry, and everybody was able to provide for me. Like, I had something to provide for my community, and my community was able to provide for me. And if I was struggling, I could go outside, and I knew my ecology. I was able to survive even down into the winters. But then, in doing that, and in recognizing myself where I was, so many people wanted to find that same, that same feeling that I was expressing. So many people wanted to be able to find that health and that success that I was finding in life. And so people started to take me away from where I was living to show them how to do it in other places. And every time I've left my home to go somewhere else, I've been greeted by the most beautiful people in those places, those people that represent the same things that we represent, those people that have been playing around outside and growing the food and, and, and caring about the things that we all need to care about. And I've been able to meet them all around our country, and I've been even able to meet them all around the world. And it's given me so much hope where I didn't have it before. It gives me so much hope because I know there's so many people on the ground doing the right things and taking it to, to the point where they're putting it on themselves. They're taking their lives and putting their lives on the line and doing these things so that we can all have a better tomorrow together. And I know it, and I know it, and I walk around with that hope every day, and I bring it wherever I go so I can share it with everybody so everybody can feel it too and everybody can bring it where they are as well. And I know that we can, and this is so special here right now. I have not seen something like this before. A community coming together for this level of health for each other is something I've never experienced in this country. In this country that is, is everybody is out to make money off of everybody. Everybody's out to take everybody's energy. I have not seen something where people are coming together like this to bring and give energy to each other. And I'm going to take this energy with me and I'm going to use it as I take these steps every day to change the world in a big way. And I thank you guys for bringing me here for this. I didn't even expect this at all. I think I'll just show you guys some more cool mushrooms. <laughs> Here's some oyster mushrooms. <laughs> oh, gosh. Here's some Psilocybe ovoidio cystidiata. This one is funny. This one grows along the Susquehanna River from Herkimer, New York. Is anybody familiar with that word, Herkimer? Herkimer 
Yeah, there's a lot of diamonds there that get spread around. Um, but the beautiful Susquehanna River, one of the oldest rivers in the whole world, um, it's debated whether or not it's as old as the Nile. Um, and there's some very interesting petroglyphs that have been found all along the river and very interesting stories. Um, there was a man named John um, that was guided by some um, level of angelic uh, um, Elohim or uh, Cherubim or something, one of the angelic uh, uh, levels. Um, to find these golden plates in the Susquehanna River, uh, which he found, and then he founded the Mormon religion off of it. Um, really interesting stories along that river. Lots of really interesting energy that flows down from, their, from Herkimer all the way down into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but along the Susquehanna River, um, this very interesting organism grows, Salaspia ovoidiosistidiata. And it tends to sprawl out from the river whenever humans come and start disturbing the ecology. Um, it usually stays really close to the water, um, but when people come around and start breaking down the trees and creating wood chips and things like that, it starts growing around colleges and police offices and libraries. And um, I found the most of them around the University of Delaware. And it's funny because the kids there probably are buying Psilocybe cubensis whenever the Psilocybe ovoidiosistiata, which is like two times more potent, grows in like all of their mulch. Um, and we found the big mulch pile in the forest that they go grab it from, which is a really interesting experience. Um, there's just like giant mountains of mulch that are inhabited um, that somebody comes and scoops and just dumps. So they just take the mycelium and dump it all around the campus. Um, really interesting. Um, but it shows itself and it's just like here, like you guys are like messing stuff up. Like I'm right in front of your face. Eat me, you know. Um, but it only takes a, a little bit of levels of uh, ecological literacy. And this is the one that we're finding out that was capable of uh, remediating parasitic honey mushroom uh, uh, infections. Um, so yeah, that one's really cool, really easily cultivated on wood chips. Um, I've seen people cultivate this next to springs, uh, where spring water is coming out of the ground, because this is the uh, vernal psilocybe. It grows in the springtime. Um, one of Paul's friends that I actually met, Paul Stamets, has a friend that looks like a wizard guy. He's kind of, well, he looks like more of like a gnome guy. He looks like a Gandalf kind of character. I can't remember his name right now, but it's like a popular name in mycology. Um, but he's, he discovered this in Pennsylvania. Discovered. But he's a cool guy. Um, and they sent off the samples uh, and the information to Gaston Guzman in uh, Mexico, who was the individual that was, uh, would classify psilocybe. Um, and Paul and his friend wanted to call it the vernal psilocybe or psilocybe vernalis for spring psilocybe. Um, but Gaston Guzman called it psilocybe ovoidiosistidiata based off of its spore, uh, the way its spore looks. Um, but yeah, super, super potent. Um, I've had multiple friends have like out-of-body experiences off of off of like, you know, like four or five grams of these thinking like, yo, I'm going to take the heroic dose, but like it, the compounds are significantly different levels in there. Um, this one would do really good here. This is uh, Sarcomyxa serotina. Um, this one is coming into play as a cold weather uh, outdoor species. And I think this would do really well here because I've seen it also in high altitudes in Washington. Um, this is the Globifomies graveo lens, or the sweet knot polypore, which is usually found brown. Um, I found a very fresh specimen, and this picture was actually featured in Fun Dry magazine, even though it was only taken on an iPhone, because not many people find it looking like this. Um, and it smells like fruity, like fruity perfume smells like come out of there. And I could only imagine, like, I don't know, let's use a relatable word, like the terps in there. Um, I couldn't imagine what the terps in there are like. But like, there's all sorts of different volatile aromatic compounds in mushrooms that provide to the experience. Um, on that note, um, I think that as we start to refine these substances, we're going to lose some of the experiences as any individual that has any intimate relationship with cannabis knows that distillate is not the same as like a full spectrum with the flavors and all of the other essences in it. Because um, people are starting to do this um, with philosophy, which is a beneficial thing. Don't get me wrong, because there are individuals that that might be the way that they need to consume it. Um, but I think it's important to recognize uh, the kind of uh, play that the aromatics and the flavor compounds have in a medicinal experience, um, where so many people are like, 
turned off because all we ever eaten our whole childhood is refined sugar and salt and fatty foods. Our palates are so perverted that we can't enjoy something that has a little bit of bitterness to it um, because uh, who knows why, what that stuff does to our tongues. Um, but it takes a level of refinement to be able to then discern what's even going on with these kinds of things because we're, we're the generation that's going to consume this and say, this is what it does, whereas there were people in, in ancient Asia that were consuming the mushrooms and saying like, oh, this is good for this, because they were that sensitive and that in tune with their bodies to be able to consume something and say, oh, this is like, I feel this here, or I feel this here, this is alleviating this for me. That's how all of this, how all of the medical or the traditional Asian medicine was even developed. Um, here we have birch polypore. I've noticed a large amount, a large population of middle class and upper class American youth uh, around my age moved to Central and South America in uh, tropical islands over the period of COVID. Um, if anybody's on Instagram or social media, you've probably seen somebody with some bread move to Mexico or something like Tulum, probably. How many of y'all know somebody that went to Tulum or is like, how? yeah, right, all right, cool. Um, so a lot of people that have no experience traveling are probably gonna get intestinal parasites as they like get down there, and that's gonna be an, uh, one that you could sell them real easy because they like to buy stuff. Um, so this is birch polypore, um, and I think the Latin name has changed to Fomitopsis uh, betulina now, um, but this one's really, really good for intestinal parasites, even tapeworms and stuff like that. Um, and it can be cultivated. It can be cultivated. It's a saprophytic, and it, and it can be grown on birch uh, sawdust in birch logs. Uh, here we have Ganoderma sessile. This is another one of the Ganodermas. This is a lacate Ganoderma. Uh, if you're going to get into Ganoderma medicine, I would recommend learning the difference between lacate and non-lacate Ganodermas um, because they have different medicinal qualities. Um, lacate Ganodermas are more desirable for people, um, for uh, visual aesthetics and things like that, but when it comes down to extracts and in, uh, in co uh, d product developments and things like that, or formulations, it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Um, here's, here's some of the, uh, the uh, Fistulina hepatica that's being, well this isn't, this is a wild specimen, but this is the mushroom that's being cultivated now in New Jersey by my friends at uh, Garden State Mushrooms. And uh, we just slice it up like that and eat it raw. It has a citrusy lemon kind of taste. Um, and the feel and the mouth feels like a, like a firm watermelon. Um, here we have Sporacis spathulata. Um, this is a cauliflower mushroom that grows in uh, Pennsylvania and has been cultivated in Asia. Um, so here's, here's one of the things that I recommend a lot of uh, individuals do. Um, if you find a new mushroom, if you find something that you're interested in growing, look it up and see if, if somebody's doing it anywhere. And if somebody's doing it anywhere, you can do it where you are. Just buy the research paper or email the person. Like, try and find a, somebody, some way to get in communication. But there's a way to figure out if it's being done anywhere, you can do it. If somebody can do something anywhere, you can do it anywhere. It's that we're, we're living in a time, especially in the United States, I don't think... I think people that haven't had the opportunity to leave the United States don't realize how privileged we are. You can get anything in a day. You can literally get anything overnighted to you in a day. Anything. Anything. No matter where you are in the United States. Anything you need, you can get to your ha wherever your address is, if you have an address, the next day. That is insane. There's places where you take days to get something. Like, so... If, if somebody's doing something somewhere, you can do it here. And, and people are cultivating this in Asia, and it has medicinal benefits of its own that I haven't even explored because I don't have the time. I, I, I just want to keep dropping gems like this for people, and hopefully other individuals will take this up. Because like, I've, I've discovered so many things on my, in my path of, of existence that each of these individual things could create a whole industry. Each of these things could create a business for somebody. And I've just like... I can't do all of it, so I'm like hoping that I can help other individuals alleviate economic stress in, in ways that also helps alleviate the ecological stress and the physical stress that we're all dealing with. Because all of these things are medicinal, or if not medicinal, good food. Um, and then and encourage the youth. That kid over there with the little tie-dye, he doesn't even know, but he could probably teach you guys all how to identify mushrooms and what's medicinal. And like, he even knows, I was talking with him. He was like, when we were leaving the house um, to go to the airport, our dog's name is Emmett. He's like, Emmett's in the car with us. And I was like, what? And he's like, his hair is on the chair. His DNA's in here. And I was like, what, bro? I was like, fist bumped him. And, and I was like, 
I told him about cloning and he immediately understood the concept and he was like, so I can have another Emmett when we get to Colorado. And I was like, I mean, we have to wait for it to be born, but yeah. I mean, it's like, I don't even know how. Like he's, I, I, I didn't go in the woods and stuff till I was 18. I lived in cities. Like I didn't get exposed to this stuff. Like I was, the rapid evolution that happened in my capability to understand the science and ecological literacy happened because I did a lot of psychedelics and I broke down linear time. I was able to have more experience and less time as people that were just living the regular thing. Like, does that make sense? Yes. All right, cool. Um, so I had a lot of experience and a little bit of time, but he has seen so much in his six years that I didn't even ever see until I was 18. I don't even know how he perceives the world. Like, I, I, I know as much as I can for being his father, but it, it, it like baffles me all the time when he says something that just shows me how perceptive he is of reality. And, and all of us were and all of us are, but we were told that our, conscious, our consciousness was just a little voice in our head that tells us what's right and wrong instead of the thing that's supposed to be speaking out of your mouth and living your life because it's you. <laughs> um, yeah, and all sorts of weird things like that. <laughs> Um, here's the maitake, um, and here's what I was telling you guys. Uh, me and my buddy, if for any of you guys that can see that picture, me and my buddy found all of that in four hours, just me and one other person. There's no reason anybody should be hungry. Like, that comes all out of Pennsylvania, and we're leaving way more dead than we pull out fresh, and this ships all over. I mean, like, I'm not the biggest proponent of shipping stuff, but, like, there's just so much medicinal food, like, highly medicinal food grown without spray, without far away from people's urban environments and chemicals and gross stuff. That's, like... Um, what does this have? Um, um, uh, there's this special polysaccharide in here, in the, in the maitake. Uh, defraction beta-glucan. The, the, the maitake has a special defraction beta-glucan that has like incredible medicinal benefits aside from most polysaccharides that we see in mushrooms. I can't remember exactly what it's medicinal for, but look up defraction beta-glucan. And the fact that like, we can just pull that out and I can like, that, that amount I could concentrate into amount of oil that would, I could give to everybody and would probably be like enough to last you for a year for the amount of medicinal potency that it has. In this, in this four hours with one person, you could go do that every single day. That's insane. Like there's so much wealth in, in the environment still. And like we've, we've taken down the, the um, in your face wealth. We've taken down all of the like, the big trees and like the sparkly, like, like, oh, this is clearly valuable. We've already taken all that out of the environment. So the mushrooms are literally where it's at until we are able to bring the environments back to that level. Um, these are naturalized shiitake. They, uh, shiitake are Asian. Um, the golden oysters that I showed earlier, they're, they're Russian or Northern, Northern Asian. Um, and they, they naturalized in Pennsylvania and the shiitake is naturalized in North Carolina. Um, so the shiitakes grow, grow naturalized. I wouldn't say they're wild, but they grow naturalized in, in North Carolina now. And I saw this picture. I wish I had a, the, the, a broader picture of it, but I lost those files. It was on an entire oak tree. It wasn't just like an oak log of shiitake. It was an entire oak tree of shiitake. Like that whole table was just one round of that tree. And there were still more shiitakes on that tree. Uh, here we have Lapista nuda. This one's gonna be really nice for um, composting. Uh, for gr growing in compost, growing in leaf mulch. Uh, we have uh, Flamulina volutipes. Um, this one is really fun to play with um, because you can grow it um, tall, skinny, short, fat, white, brown. It, it, it takes to so, so much different um, um, environmental stimuli. And I think it's a really interesting metaphor for like, like you take the light away, it turns white. You put the light, it turns brown. Like it's... It's, it's the same thing. It's just a really good metaphor for, for life. It just happens really fast. Um, and then truffles. How many of y'all have land? All right. Let's, uh, let's try and get some land together as a cooperative. How about that? We make that one of the initiatives. Um, but when, whenever y'all get some land, or those of you that do have land, I would recommend those of uh, connecting with individuals that have mycological capacity to introduce truffle cultures to native nut trees. Um, because it takes, we've, we're seeing this across the whole country now, especially around Pennsylvania and Virginia and Oregon um, and Northern California. Um, individuals are planting nut trees 
that within six to seven years are producing truffles, then that produces truffles for the rest of the life of that tree, which is a high, high valuable product. And I'm looking at truffles from aside from just like shaving a little bit on some food. Like this is a highly neurological food. This is one of the most advanced forms of fungal life that exists on the planet. Truffles used to be uh, epigeist. Truffles used to be above ground guild mushrooms, but they figured out that the best place to grow is underground where the temperature stays the same and where the, uh, where the humidity and environment stays the same and where they could be protected. But all they had to do was entice another organism because they need the mammals to, to fulfill their life cycle. And because of that, I mean, look at my truffled vol theory. I'm, I'm, I'm developing it still, still, but the idea... Sometimes you take psychedelics and you have an idea that's so expansive, then you're thrown back into this world where you're living b day by day and speaking in a blah, 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 that takes time to even, like, say. And you have to, like, take this big idea and, like, try and, like, get it into this weird reality. Like, it's not even weird. Like, you just have to take that big idea and, like, get it into this space-time that's bigger than this space-time. But it takes... But it's getting, uh, since 2012, the, everybody said it was the Mayan end of the world. It was only the end of time. It was when people started realizing that time was nonlinear and that we are capable of instant manifestation because we're all creators. Um, yeah, so truffles. These are some organ black truffles. This is uh, Leucagnium carthusian or something like that. Um, this one smells like pineapples. Um, and it could be utilized for like a fruity um, uh, kind of infusions. Um, and I mean, for, for anybody that's interested in like terps or wine, like uh, I think that we're going to bring on a whole new level of myco mycological sommelier uh, where whenever everybody's like, oh, what does this mushroom taste like? We can give them something besides earthy or mushroomy because there's so many levels of complexities, but we haven't refined ourselves to, to taste it. Like, like um, you, give, you give somebody that never smelled weed before a, a, a container of weed to smell, and they'll be like, oh, it stinks, it smells skunky. But like, you give it to somebody that has been smoking weed for a while, and they'll be like, oh, it smells like, like apple pie, or it smells like papayas, or whatever. But somebody that's not discerned themselves, or somebody that's not refined themselves, won't smell that. Same way that they won't taste the mushroom and taste anything else besides earthy or mushroomy. So I think that we're going to develop a whole new linguistic structure around sensory experiences with the mushrooms. Um, this is another North American one. This one grows with pecans. This is uh, Tuber leonii. Um, this one actually just had a research, or just had a, like, a sensational media article about it. Um, that's a meme. Um, Morels. I mean, the whole West Coast was on fire. Uh, there's going to be lots more of these. I found these in Oregon in like 2018. Um, on a second year burn. Um, but everywhere that the forest fires happen, especially from like this area all, all the way to the west coast, um, you get the burn morels that come out um, because the whole environment goes bacterial and they are bacteriophages. They eat bacteria. They like literally farm and waddle up and consume massive amounts of bacteria and produce delicious chicken, fishy tasting mushrooms. Um, so here's just some cool uh, aesthetically pleasing things to kind of like end the talk on. Um, that tree, this tree right here, this one uh, paid at least three car payments and a, and a couple phone bills. Um, it's really, really nice when you can go out into the woods and be able to interact with it in a way that helps to propel you uh, and, and you know fuel you. Um, here we have all sorts of different chanterelles I've found around the whole country. Um, here we have one with a somatic mutation, and then we also have the Cantharellus aplichinensis, which is specific to the Appalachian Mountains. Um, wait, the... All right, and then here we have hiddenum species, which e every day we're finding out that, like, these are the hedgehog mushrooms. We're finding so many different variants in the hedgehog mushrooms, like, every day with the DNA. Um, that's Leo a couple years ago, and he found those. He's, he finds so much more mushrooms because he's closer to the ground, and he also hasn't been looking at a screen for 27 years yet. Um, so his eyes are a little bit better than mine. Um, here we have, this one is a, a, a variant of a black trumpet that only exists in this one neighborhood in Pennsylvania that we can find. And like, these are the things, has anybody ever heard of a Fungi Foundation out of Chile or Juliana Ferchi? She created an initiative 
where the whole country of Chile now has to recognize fungi in their schools. But not only that, if they want to develop on new land, they have to do a fungal assessment. And if they're going to put any fungi at risk of extinction by developing on that land, they can't develop on that land. Imagine that. Imagine that. But we live in greedy America. But it's, uh, I mean, like these, like the all, all, there's no, there is no other. There is no separation of self. If you eat enough mushrooms, your, your, your lines of separation will be dissolved. Your edge detection will literally be non-existent um, if you eat enough mushrooms. Uh, and, and, and understanding that, you understand that those mushrooms that I hold in my hand are a reflection of myself. They are a part of my essence. They are a part of my being. They are a part of the entire entity that I am, that you are, that we all are. And in losing that, you lose a part of yourself that you might never be able to see again. And I think that that's really important because in discovery of yourself, it's important to have all the tools necessary to be able to recognize who you are. Um, so I think it's really important to, to key in on these specific species. And, I really, uh, and I, um, as, as more, pe more people are starting to go as the night moves on, I really want to encourage individuals um, that have the interest to start delving into DNA work in molecular biology. Because as we're living in a world of rapid extinction, uh, we're also living in a world of rapid sequencing, um, where we can be sequencing organisms as they're going extinct so that we have that information for whenever the next generation stops participating in this destructive, these destructive systems and we start participating in regenerative systems and building these e ecosystems back, we have the information on how to build those ecosystems back where the, inf where the organisms are no longer there. <clears throat> um, yeah, so here's some more pretty mushroom pictures. This is the Ischnoderma resinosum. Um, when it's young, it grows white, and you can cut the tip off, and it tastes like skirt steak. So that's the one that uh, we're de developing cultivation protocols for right now, and we're selling the culture already, and more and more people are, are growing it around the country now. So there's going to be, by fall, a whole new wave of mushrooms that have never been available to the market on the market now. Um, Like like my culture collection, yeah. uh, it's looking pretty slim right now because I just was asked to leave my place of residence like a couple months ago, and in leaving there, I left my refrigerator with my culture collection in it because I it was sensitive and I wanted to take it myself, and I was overwhelmed and I left it and they threw it away. Yeah, yeah. So um, right now it's looking pretty slim, but you know we're entering into mushroom season, so we're collecting a lot of things. And as I go around and find things that are valuable, I'm collecting them. And you know people are sending us stuff every day, um, but it's pretty slim right now. It was pretty expensive at one point, um, but right now, um, now that I've got that kick in the butt, I got a cryo doer. So everything that we have now is going to go back up into cryo preservation, and that's just going to go wherever I go. That's lock and chain. Like mycosymbiotics cryopreservation. Um, I don't really, I don't really procure species from Asia because I'm more interested in finding the novel species that are at, in your front yard. You know, like for real, like there could be some crazy yeast in your front yard that's like way cooler than whatever people are bringing in from Asia, you know? Oh, you're coming to the class? Oh. Let's run it. Um, for those of you all that don't know, I'm doing a pop-up uh, DNA barcoding for beginners class on Thursday before I leave, um, where I'll be showing everybody how to extract DNA from fungi and plants, uh, amplify the DNA, um, or amplify genes in the DNA and then read it and then send it off to be sequenced so that you can start identifying mushrooms yourself. Um, the investment to start doing it is like 1,200. Um, but as a community, you guys can get the tools together and start, you know, coming together and having somebody that knows how to use it, bringing samples, and you know, identifying new species literally in the Denver metropolitan area. Um, so I'll just finish up with some more cool pictures. Um, if anybody has any questions as we go along, please let me know. Has anybody read the uh, Matsutake at the End of the World? Yeah. yeah, definitely check out that book. This is Matsutake that I found in Washington. Um, really, really beautiful mushroom. It smells like cinnamon and sweaty socks, and it's delicious. Um, 
if anybody is interested, I have a uh, episode on a TV show called Edible Mountain that was broad that broadcasts every now and then on West Virginia Public Broadcasting, but it's also streams on the internet always, so you can go check that out. It's called Edible Mountain, and we did a Chanterelle ice cream. I um, mean, I also showed them wild foraging cordyceps in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, I think that kind of stuff is really important. If anybody ever has the opportunity to engage with public access television, please take it um, because there was a point in time where all I had was a satellite on a window and I watched a Nutribullet video advertisement infomercial with this dude named David Wolf that was talking about mushrooms and algae and I was spun on acid and that's what I had available to me to consume for content. Like, I'm not vouching for anybody's information in this world, but like, because somebody was on public access television talking about something like that, my mind was changed in that moment. Um, so there's really powerful things that can happen from um, making yourself available to uh, communities that you think you might not think may be interested in hearing this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, here's some other consumption methods. Or uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of extracts and infusions, uh, concentrated extracts, and then infusions into other means of consumption, like honey, oils, um, direct consumption. Uh, my partner here has been consuming cordyceps extract directly, and in coffee. Any other ways? Just straight up, Just straight up or in coffee. I um, mean, the cordyceps extracts like really buttery, yeasty. Do you have any other add? We need more words. Um, so here is some other innovative things that we've been playing around with. And this is, I took two kitchen bowls um, and I put hemp and mycelium in between it and I let the mycelium grow on the hemp. Um, and then I took the mycelium, I took the bowls away and then I put it in the oven to kill it. And then I let it sit outside in the rain and in the sun for weeks and it stayed a bowl and I could throw it around and it stayed like that. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then I did this video with The Verge where we went out and found a very tenacious uh, mycelium that was, um, um, it grows on the locust tree. It is, it is Felinus robina. Uh, so we found the Felinus robina growing on the locust tree. It's really hard and it's a, a perennial. It grows for multiple years and its mycelium is also really hard. So we went and we took a sample of that and they took that mycelium back to New York and they made a brick with it. And you can watch that on YouTube. Um, it's the Verge Mushroom Brick video. Um, so yeah, the cordyceps was really the thing that um, secured my career really um, because I was doing all of this science and I was still the same person but I had no um, resume. So nobody was like Nobody would show me the time of day. I was just a kid growing mushrooms in a grow tent, posting weird videos on YouTube. I was like, I was like the dude on the side of the road with the sign that says the most conscious stuff you ever heard ever, but nobody cares because he's just the dude on the side of the road and like people don't think he's successful at all. So like, I was like slowly becoming that guy and then I did the cordyceps stuff and uh, it, it worked out really well in se securing my career because then I went to go teach at Telluride with a bunch of other successful mycologists. Um, and then people started taking my work seriously and then they started seeing I was doing a whole bunch of other cool science. Um, but here's some core, cool cordyceps stuff. Um, the other one is Talipocladium ophioglossoides, which has shown neurological benefits. It also shows a lot of benefits for uh, prostate health. Um, and uh, that one, I was the f if I'm not mistaken, I was the first person in the world to cultivate this mushroom in vitro. Um, and since then, my friends Jeff and Ryan have also cultivated it in vitro, um, which could be really cool for you know prostate health or, or another nootropic type mushroom um, to be able to bring it into cultivation and kind of key in on those things. So these are the things where like I am so happy that I'm not stuck like doing a bunch of stuff to make money anymore, where I can actually like spend you know a week or two with one mushroom and actually give it the time that I need to develop the protocols for it, um, where before I couldn't, I never had the time to do it. So everything I could do was just in the moment of it. Um, so these are some of my early uh, trials with cordyceps. Um, I grew them in metal trays until, I grew them in aluminum trays, but everybody told me not to do that because they said they could accumulate aluminum. Um, 
So I was trying to save some money to send off a sample grown in aluminum to this uh, laboratory to get it tested, but I never got to that point. Um, so I just stopped growing them in aluminum. Um, and I started doing them in glass um, and played around with different light techniques and played around with different temperatures until we keyed it in. And then I wrote two books on how to cultivate them as I developed more protocol for it. Um, and they were the first English, uh, that was the first English literature on, culti on cordyceps cultivation anywhere in the world. Um, so since then, there's been cordyceps farms popping up everywhere in English-speaking countries all over the world since 2016, whenever I told people how to do this. Because whenever, whenever I got the cordyceps, I was so inspired by it because I knew its medicinal benefits, and I went online to all the blogs and groups that I communicated with about how to grow mushrooms, and everybody's like, you can't grow cordyceps. Only people in Asia know how to grow cordyceps, and nobody's going to share. You can't do it. Everybody told me I couldn't do it. Everybody's like, you can't do it. And I was like, all right, bet, I'll do it. And so like, I was like, if somebody's doing it somewhere, I can do it here. So I watched a whole bunch of Asian videos, and I didn't know what they were doing, and then I replicated it just by wa mimicking what they were doing. Like They were like boiling potatoes and putting a bunch of random ingredients in this water and then like making rice with this potato water and like putting the culture in it. So I just did it, and it started working, and then I was able to refine it from there. And then... As soon as I wrote the book, I sold the book for like $10, and then we started open sourcing all the information on the Cordyceps Cultivation Group on Facebook. And then, I mean, you know what happens when things go open source, once people stop trying to hide everything for themselves and realize collectively we can all benefit and, and evolve things way faster. Um, now we have Cordyceps Cultivation at a, at a broad scale across the country and in different countries now. Um, and along the way, a big uh, part of my work has been to make it cool to do this and make it culturally relevant, which is becoming more and more beneficial or more and more uh, relevant now as every day my likeness is getting hundreds and thousands of views for all these big media conglomerates. So um, lots of young people are seeing this and it's becoming cool. It's not like weird and nerdy to do mushrooms now when there's the young black rapping kid that looks like every other rapper doing the mushroom stuff. Like maybe I can do it because I look like that or that's something that I look up to. Because if I saw that when I was a kid, I would have been like, fuck yeah, I just didn't see it. <clears throat> so yeah, Mycosymbiotics wants you to join the militaris, uh, the cordyceps militaris that is. Um, so yeah, we've been playing around with bee mushroomed with some of the uh, bee ex uh, the mushroom extracts with bees, and um, I can't say any definitive results from that just yet. Um, and doing a lot of DNA work, which as I mentioned on Thursday, if anybody's interested, I will be doing a molecular uh, DNA barcoding for beginners class um, here in Denver. Um, and uh, yeah, every every day I'm just working on saving up to get more of the equipment that I think would be beneficial for educating more people um, and for doing more of the cool work that I want to see done in the world. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, if anybody can get to Pennsylvania August 6th through the 8th for MycoFest, definitely do it. We have vending spots open. Like get somebody rent a bus and just get all of y'all over there. It's so cool. We got three days camping, light breakfast and lunch included. Experts from around the country are going to be there, like literally from the whole country, experts in mycology and permaculture. We're going to have live music, live art, um, and we're going to be doing forays. We have a cordyceps-specific foray, um, and we're going to be having live microscopy and real-time DNA sequencing at the festival. So I definitely recommend people getting out there. It's the seventh, it'll be the sixth annual festival because this the sixth annual was supposed to be last year, but COVID happened and all that. Um, but yeah, we've been rocking out, teaching ecological literacy and having a good time uh, for years. And I really would encourage more and more people to become part of that, Myco fam. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening to me rant and ramble and cry and be a crazy, messy human being in front of all y'all. Yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions or anything, I'll be around for a little bit. I'm hanging out. Um, does anybody have any questions while I still have the microphone to answer in front of people? Yep. Um, so for some of those uh, wood chip loving Celosophies, when's the best time of year that you spawn? All right, so for wood chip loving Celosophies, the best time of year that I would spawn them would be in the spring and the fall um, when the temperature's not too hot, but that's also the time that they usually would be fruiting, so that's the time that their spores are usually, like... Uh, ecologically used to go growing. Um, so that's when they would be more readily uh, uh, um, growing. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Yep. Um, so for aggressive, um, aggressive wood chip varieties like Strafaria or Psilocybe, um, a year or two, depending on how much it rains. If it's a dry year, then it can extend because it didn't, it didn't spend its energy fruiting. Um, and, uh, it, but if you keep adding more wood chips to the area, or if you keep adding more material or compost to the area, you can keep it going for years and years. And they'll probably grow out into different parts of your yard. Yeah. All right, so for labs to test DNA stuff, there's more and more independent people coming out. And then for, like, analytical stuff, uh, I mean, I, there's companies that do it. I don't know if they're public. Uh, there's some people here. They can make themselves known if they want to. Um, but uh, then otherwise it's going to be community stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, right on. Well, if nobody has any more questions, I mean, I'll still be up here otherwise. Um, do you have Oh, um, how did you sign up for the class? Oh yeah, I'm gonna send that out on the email. Um, are you on Instagram or? If you can get on my Instagram, my link on my on my Instagram page has the ticket information. That'd be the easiest thing. Um, um, yeah, I'm just trying to smoke some hash and eat some food now. If anybody wants to do that, that would be cool. Oh, sweet. All right. Well, much love, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Um, I will hope to connect with you guys into the future. Thank you so much, William. Uh, before everyone leaves, I just have a few more things. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to some of our community partners, um, Lions Main Mushroom Supply Company, Fresh from the Farm Fungi, Elevated Mushrooms, and Monster Mushrooms. Uh, I'd also like to invite everyone to go either to the back table or come see me up front to sign up for our email list. Um, we'll be sending out information around membership opportunities, and as we are developing the co-op, we love all of your feedback because it is an organization of us. Um, so we want you to be a part of it. Um, oh, and one more thing around harm reduction. If you're using psilocybin mushrooms, please take consideration around your set and setting before your journey. And don't forget to integrate afterwards so you can optimize your experience. Um, and lastly, I just want to acknowledge that we are on stolen land in Denver. So I just would like to acknowledge the ancestors and the people that came before us. Um, and, and um, just have a moment of silence for the land we stand on. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, feel free to hang out and mingle and make friends. Have a great night.